take a look at, at the map here uh, of, of all the places that you could hit right now. And it's taken now at least three days. You've been in the Situation Room when these discussions were, were happening. Why is it taking so long? Well, you know, it could happen any minute. Literally, we don't know. Uh, I, I think the delay and the, and, the, and the leaked discussions that we've seen already shows irresolution on the part of the Biden administration. And part of their problem, your, your graphic just demonstrated, all of these uh, sources of uh, belligerence in the, middle, in the Middle East today all tie back to Iran. This is an Iranian-directed conflict. It has been since October the 7th. The Biden White House simply will not face up to that reality. Uh, I've listened carefully to what administration spokesmen have said since Sunday, and that, that's the only real public evidence we have. But I conclude from that that, their, that whatever their response is, it will not include targets inside Iran. And I think that's a mistake, because I think we need to look at this not simply as the tragic death of three Americans. Uh, that alone certainly warrants a vigorous response. But it also follows months of attacks on U.S. Right. personnel, civilian and military, around the region, over 150 attacks on U.S. naval vessels, commercial ships in the Red Sea. Iran itself has paid no price for these attacks. None of the retaliation uh, for the attacks in, in Iraq and Syria uh, have been in Iran. None of the response to the Houthi attacks have been in Iran. No response from Hamas's attack out of Gaza has been in Iran. No response to Hezbollah from Lebanon has been in Iran. I Iran is conducting this war effectively cost-free. And as long as it's allowed to do that, the, the, the conflict will grow more serious and more complicated. That's the point the administration simply does not get. Yeah, you know, we talked about this last night, two different worldviews, that the administration views everything through the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, you and others view the Middle East through uh, Iran as the, the chief protagonist. Um, in this. Donald Trump, who's, who you served and you were there for part of the negotiations of the Abraham Accords, some of the peace deals that were made between the Arab countries and Israel, had this to say about what's going on right now. Take a listen. If I were in the White House, you would have never had this attack. You would have never had the attack on Israel. You would have never had the attack on Ukraine. The foreword from your book, devastating terrorist attacks on Israel by Hamas and Hezbollah, both armed and financed by Iran, may not produce the same reaction from Trump as before. A newly inaugurated Trump could seek a deal with Iran. And I, I guess what I'm, I'm troubled by, I know you have some differences with, with the president, we'll get to those, but the Middle East really was never more peaceful than when Donald Trump was there. There were meaningful peace treaties. Iran was put in a box. To your point, Iran was hit. Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Iran Revolutionary Guard was killed on Donald Trump's orders. Why the, why the could, why not the credit for what happened in the past? Well, I think it was certainly the right thing to do to withdraw from the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. And I think the sanctions that were imposed after that were correct. They were not enforced as part of maximum pressure, however. Biden has loosened them e even beyond that. But, but, you know, Trump is incredibly transactional. And even as he withdrew from the 2015 nuclear deal, he talked about a bigger deal with Iran. Uh, in, in my last days in the White House at the G7 summit at Biarritz in August of 2019, Emmanuel Macron, president of France, had Trump within an eyelash of meeting with the Iranian foreign minister, whom Macron had brought into Biarritz unbeknownst to the rest of us. Uh, Netanyahu uh, may, may think that he would have a stronger uh, friend in the White House than Trump. He'd be wrong about that. I don't think Trump likes Netanyahu. So nobody knows what Trump will do. That's part of the problem. It's erratic. It's inconsistent. And I will say that many of the things uh, that came in the Middle East, the Abraham Accords being a good example, reflect the shifting geostrategic tectonic plates more than the efforts of the U.S. or, or any other particular government. I hear you, and I'll give you the last word. But if you think about what Donald Trump said, uh, there, Vladimir Putin saber-rattled when it came to Ukraine. He didn't do anything under Donald Trump. Uh, certainly, Iran was, was making mischief in the Middle East, and then Qasem Soleimani was killed, and, and they stopped. 
there was no attacks, meaningful uh, major wars between Israel uh, and Hamas or Israel and Hezbollah, and there were the Abraham Accords. And for that matter, Kim Jong-un wasn't firing off missiles. So I, I guess I, I understand your, your feelings about him. I'm just wondering if he doesn't deserve a little bit of credit for, for those things. Well, I think he does deserve some credit, but there are plenty of other reasons why things happened or didn't happen. Uh, in the case of Ukraine in particular, I think Putin had focused on Trump's wanting to withdraw from NATO and was waiting for a second Trump term. And if Trump does get reelected this November, he will withdraw from NATO uh, and Putin will take advantage of it. Thanks for watching. Go to joinnn.com to find News Nation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.